in certain situations. Okay. Now, obviously, in an organization like the prosecutor's office, um, there are Indians and there are chiefs, right? Yes, sir. Okay. You consider yourself an Indian or a chief? I'm an Indian. Okay. Well, let's talk about the chief that supervises you. Who's that? I report uh, to sergeants. Okay. Um, so I have uh, two sergeants uh, that oversee the major crimes area. Uh, the sergeants. Uh, it was run by the Division of Criminal Justice. 
in which uh, all detectives um, from the attorney general's office, along with all county prosecutors, office detectives in that. Okay. But if you were a detective in Pemberton Township, you wouldn't have gone to that school, you would have gone to a different school. Yes, they have municipal detectives. Municipal detectives. And those are what the officers of drug patrol cars that ultimately become detectives as detective on in the municipality. That's a different training process than your process. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, did you ever receive any specific training uh, on forensics? Uh, no, sir. No. Did you ever receive any specific training on gunshot residue? Uh, no, sir. Have you ever, in the course of your almost 20 years or so as a law enforcement officer, mm -hmm. have you ever, out of just pure curiosity, uh, did some research in the area of gunshot residue? Uh, no, sir. Okay. So you sit here today really not knowing much about gunshot residue. Is that a good statement? I sit here today being able to report that gunshot residue was present on the defendant's hands. Um, well, we're yes. going to get to that. But sitting here today, um, you're not very confident about how gunshot residue looks, right? I'm not a scientist. Okay, the question is specifically gunshot residue. Right now, sitting here today, you have no specialized knowledge or experience or independent research or study that gives you any insight into gunshot residue. No, sir. In fact, you read the report that was sent to the prosecutor's office, correct? Yes, sir. And um, fair to say, well, let me ask you this. When you read that report, what did you personally conclude? Gunshot residue was present on the hands of the Anything else? Certain particles. Um, the top side of the the top side of uh, the right hand and the palm of the left hand. Okay. Anything else? We then spoke to uh, Lieutenant Wilsey, who sent us uh, the, uh, the R.J. Lee lab report. Um, he offered some further explanation, uh, and uh, that the presence of gunshot residue was uh, present on Mr. Wilsey's hands. Which means what? Which means we have positive tests for gunshot residue. Which means what? Because I think it's been asked and answered. No judge, it hasn't been. It hasn't been asked and answered. <coughs> right. Um, I don't know if you recall telling a fact, I'm sure we all recall, this is about a third of the tape, that you were questioning Mr. Lewis and basically saying, you got gunshot residue on your hand. You must have fired a gun. Tell him that? Yes, sir. You told him that repeatedly, right? Yes, I did. And the reason you kept telling him that is because you personally believe that merely the presence of gunshot residue is conclusive evidence that he shot a gun. That's what I believe. You believe that? Yes, sir. Did you ever have an opportunity to really look at that report? I read the report, yes, sir. Do you see anywhere in that report where it says there's gunshot residue present in the, in the, the amounts that, we, that were mentioned in the report? And therefore, my conclusion, the conclusion of this forensic scientist is, therefore, Mr. Lewis fired a handgun or fired a weapon. Do you see that anywhere in that report? I see that there was presence of gunshot residue on his hands. And you made the leap, because if there's presence of gunshot residue on his hands, you made the leap that that meant conclusively that he fired a gun. I don't think it's a leap uh, to make that. Uh, well, maybe it's not good to make a leap, but you instantly came to that conclusion, didn't you? Yes, sir. And the reason you came to that conclusion is because you really don't know that much about gunshot residue. The reason why I came Sir, to listen to my question. I I had an answer for you. I was starting to, to answer this question. Right. The reason why I came to that conclusion is because I had two eyewitnesses that saw Mr. Lewis assassinate um, Shaquille Williams uh, in a car uh, by firing a weapon. And then I get a positive gunshot residue test on Mr. Lewis's hands. That's how I made that. Okay. Okay. We can open up a whole other area of questions as it relates to who shot who and where and when. Okay, we're gonna get into that in some some detail. Because as a matter of fact, as you've gotten in your investigation, uh let's maybe I just end with this point, Jeff. You have approximately six uh shooters in your case, don't you? We had uh, two shooters in the case. We had Douglas Lewis and Brandon. 
Okay, uh, you know Smitty, right? Yes, and he was identified as a shooter, wasn't he? We had many people that were identified um, as part of this case, and they were identified and eliminated, uh, except for Douglas Lewis and Brendan Clay, who were charged. Okay, listen to my question. He was identified as a shooter, wasn't he? He was one of the individuals that came that Lamont Brown stated at the beginning of that, that night of uh, that was a shooter. Yes, he was eliminated. Well, we're going to get to all that stuff. How about Mook? Mook is a guy that was named as a shooter, wasn't he? Deshaun Dixon's name was also uh, mentioned. Okay. Kayvon Carter's name was mentioned, wasn't it? Yes. In fact, Kayvon Carter's name was mentioned um, by several people, wasn't it? Yes, sir. As a shooter? Yes, and then eliminated by us. investigation. Okay. You do recall, since you've read all the reports, the information presented to your investigation by the sister of Mr. Williams, haven't you? The sister of uh, Shaquille Williams? Yes, we're talking about the name of Yes. The name. Yes. And as a result of your conversation or maybe reading the reports, uh, you gained some information from her, didn't you? Uh, I did. I interviewed her and through that every day. Yes. And as a result of the information that you got from her, you learned that um, Kayvon Carter and Banks, Mr. Banks, were running from the car with guns in their hand, right? Uh, I'd have to uh, go back to their statement whether or not they had guns in their hands or when they were running from uh, that area. With guns in their hands? I'd have to see what she said in her statement. Okay, well, let me help you along a little bit more. She also, you also gained information that later on, only several hours after the shooting, she looked at the Facebook page of Mr. Kayvon Carter. Do you recall that? You do, you do remember that. That's pretty significant, wasn't it? She also saw uh, the client part of this. I'm talking about the Facebook page. If you can trouble Lewis and I mean, any look, look, if, if you want to do that, we can do that all afternoon. Yeah. Judge, can we give her the sign? Uh, my name is Brother Witness to listen to the question and answer the question. Yes, sir. It would be significant evidence in a case such as this that a person that was identified as being at the scene with a gun in his hand later on, several hours later, on his own Facebook page, was sitting on a video, or however they do it on Facebook page, with the same gun that was seen earlier by the sister of the deceased, right? That's, that's what we call evidence, right? I'd have to see what... I, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Rock, absolutely. I understand what you're saying. I'd have to recall through her interview exactly what she said. If we might want to break that, we could require a long conversation. In fact, if you can step down the line and come back in, I'll talk to the five members of the testimony. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll go break for lunch now. Do not discuss the case with anyone. Not the other jurors. I think the spouse or close friend is still this group in the charge of the law and instructed the deliberation. Then you want to discuss the case when you call the people together in the deliberation room. Do not listen. Or read any television newspaper or other account on file a case reflected in the internet research or investigation. Do not communicate with anyone on this case. On your cell phone, you are only consider the evidence in your version of the And may only discuss the evidence from the deliberation. Do I have your choice? Yes. yes. 145. Very good afternoon. We are uh, ready to continue. Uh, Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Um, before, we, before we go, we talked about um, information um, that you obtained in the investigative process. That's a follow-up question? Yes, sir. I'm not going to ask you specifically what did John Smith say, because that could be your say, maybe not, but it might be. But what I am going to ask you is, as a result of talking to John Smith, what, if anything, did you do? What did you, what were your, what was your thought process as to say? Follow me? Yes, sir. Okay. For some reason, I ask you a question and you don't understand me or I mess it up or whatever, just let me know. Okay? Agreed. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as a result of having a conversation, did you have occasion to look on Facebook to determine whether or not Kayvon Carter would, had a gun in his hand on Facebook? I did not see a Facebook video of Kayvon Carter. Okay. You would agree with me that information <coughs> Exactly that information was provided to your detectives in the course of the investigation. I would, yes. 
and that they were they were told and you were told that that figure was on Facebook with a gun. Yes. Okay. Now, I would suspect I'm not a trained investigator, but I would suspect that information would be pretty critical in a case like this when there's an issue as to who who actually did this. You would agree with me? Yes. Can I? Can I? Well, yes. We were talking. Me. When we talk about thought process and how we okay. you brought that up. So, um, in regards to Ms. Newton, uh, in her statement stated that uh, that night she saw Kayvon Carter run away from the scene with a gun in his hand. Uh, that <coughs> being said, it was also nine o'clock at night with a dark colored gun, um, and then a Facebook live video with somebody else holding a gun. There would be no way to say that that gun that she may or may not have saw running away from the scene was the same gun on Facebook. We're talking serial numbers, we're talking calibers. There was, there'd be no way to distinguish one from the other. Now you indicated that she, she saw a gun when the person ran away from the car, right? That's what she said. That's what she said. And you have no reason to doubt it. That's what she said she saw. Okay. Did she describe it to you? I think she stated, and I, I look at it again, I think she said it was possibly dark or silver in color. Which she saw two. She saw one was silver and one was dark, right? She saw, well, one was Kayvon Carter, one she said was very good. Okay. Yeah. So it was two guns. Two guns, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, that's what I meant. Two of them. That's Not one right. person carrying two of them. That, that, that's fine. But you would agree with me that it may be remote. Like, for instance, I have, <coughs> I have a pen over here, and there's probably a lot of pens that look exactly like it. Right? Follow me so far, yes, sir. But if I pulled an armed robbery where I took a pen and I took the pen and I stuck it in somebody's throat and said, give me your money, and later on I'm on Facebook and I'm waving this pen around, don't you think, maybe not, but don't you think that has some evidential value in the investigation? The pen? The gun. The gun. Um, there, there could be some evidential value. Um, the, on the issue we talked about how we proceed with investigative steps is two eyewitnesses did not put Kayvon Carter as a shooter, and Kahit Sarudi, who was in the car with Shaquille Williams, did not put Kayvon Carter as a shooter. Um, in that aspect, uh, we have to start eliminating suspects, and Kayvon Carter was eliminated as a suspect. And you eliminated him because Mr. Sarugi, who was a passenger in the car, didn't say Kayvon Carter was uh, the person that shot me. Well, the same with Lamont Brown and the same with Lamont McCoy. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to talk about Mr. Sarugi and his selection of a particular person in, in a little while. Um, but I don't know. Just spitballing this for a second. Don't you think that by going and taking the next step or two, You'd be in a better position to say whether or not that video, that Facebook video, had any value if you could extract it and then show it to her? Show it to the name Newton. We talked about earlier, I don't have any crime scene experience. I don't think Ms. Newton had any crime scene experience to be able to say one, one is the same as the other. Would you agree with me that she indicated she saw a gun, right? She did, yes, sir. Okay. And if she is able to view another gun that may be similar in terms of color, shape, etc. Just that investigative effort to determine that she would be very determinative in whether or not came on part is ruled in or ruled out. Sure, right? No, this is not the case. Okay. So it has no value at all. But only hours before, two and a half hours, three hours before, the young lady says she saw these people run from the parlor dead or otherwise, with guns, that it would be absolutely no evidential value to, to pull up that, that Facebook video and look at it from an investigative perspective. It has no value to it. No, what I'm saying is, is that we would not take her identifying a dark colored gun running away from the scene with, with light as guys running fast and saying that this gun, this gun light is the exact same gun. That, that's not an idea that we would be comfortable with. What if she says it looks pretty close to that gun? Well, there's a lot of guns that look a lot of similar to Well, she may say, you know what, I'm not sure, but it sure looks like that gun. 
I, and I understand that. Okay. And wouldn't that be helpful to a trained investigator? It would be a small piece to a large puzzle. So, in other words, you made the investigative decision not to bother looking for that uh, that Facebook video, right? There were a lot of decisions that were made in this case. A lot of it also is an hour and a half or three and a half hours after the shooting, we interviewed the Mont Brown. And the Mont Brown, who witnessed the shooting, uh, did not say he on court, uh, was one of the shooters. Well, but I don't mean to quarrel with you. I really I understand. Don't. Um, Patricia Lee, whose brother was in the car, hears she gunshots, right? She heard, yes. Yes. And she looked up and saw the car recognized as her brother's car, right? She did. And she ran to that car because she wanted to help her brother, right? Yes, sir. And seeing the people coming from the car running directly to her would be something that, I don't know, maybe you don't agree with me, might be emblazoned in her memory for her entire life. Some people do have to get that tunnel vision, sir. Yes, that is correct. I'm not talking about tunnel vision. I'm talking about the shock of seeing what you're seeing and your ability to remember it and how impactful it is on your life. And all you needed to have somebody follow up on a comment, some detective to say, you know what? This lady, she saw these two guys running with guns right where her dead brother is on the street, going to be on the street in a minute or two, and then it's can't found the situation. For an investigator to say, you know what, I'm going to take 10 minutes of my time, and I'm going to go look and see if there's something to this. And that decision was made not to do that, right? Okay. okay. And, and we're not going to know because that Facebook was taken down, wasn't it? Uh, I'm not aware. You know, you, and you, you, you're not because you didn't go looking for it, right? But I'm going to mark on this. I, I trust the jury can see it, but maybe not all the time. Thank you. Thank Recollections are in your opinion because he actually saw the shooting, right? Yes, Mr. Brown saw the shooting. Okay. Mr. Brown tells us there are actually four people that he saw, right? So Lewis, he says, right? Yes, sir. He sees Gene, right? Yes. He sees Clifton, right? Yes, and he sees a guy named Mook. Yes. And he tells your detective that these four people were shooting at the car. Remember that? That's what he said, right? I think he said he saw four people run up to the car. But then he said he saw the shooting, and he indicated that at least three of them were shooting, right? Uh, yes, he did. Okay. <laughs> Now, I can agree on the uh, forensic facts that only two guns were used, right? That is correct. Okay. Now, the fact that he was telling you that there are three guns were being used, did that affect your assessment of his credibility? No, sir. Not at all? No, sir. Okay. Because he saw it, you just assume that he is probably the best historian. He was the first person to contact us as an eyewitness um, mm -hmm. to the shooting. Um, his story stayed consistent from uh, in to number one, the client, and the first person to the, to the, um, the scene when the shooting happened, mm -hmm. um, along with uh, uh, Mr. Preston. Um, so he actually said he was confused whether it was moved or something that very similar, uh, but was consistent with uh, Doug Lewis being the first Okay. Yes, sir. That's Doug Lewis. That's the guy with that, right? Yes, I go. Now, you interviewed him 
probably close in time to when you interviewed the young lady we were just talking about, right? Which one? Which young lady? No, no, no. no. What I you said, said I know, there was a phone call that was made to a detective in Pepperton, right? Yeah. He took the information, and the day after that, you, you and he, the detective from Pepperton, interviewed Mr. Brown, right? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Brown didn't, didn't want to give you a statement. He statement was made several months later. That's right. Okay. In relationship to your meeting with Mr. Brown, your personal meeting with Mr. Brown, and the interview that was done with the young lady whose brother got killed, you saw you met with Brown after you talked to her, right? I didn't speak to other uh, than that person. You didn't? Yes, sir. One of your detectives, I two of your detectives, yes, right? Yes, sir. And when you met with Mr. Brown, they had already communicated the information to you from the interview, didn't they? No, I didn't get that information until probably the next day. The next day following the day you interviewed him? Yeah. Interviewed Mr. Brown. Okay. Yes. In person. Not the phone interview, the in person interview. The in person interview at the Parish Police Station. Okay, which was March 27th. Yes, sir. Okay. So then you interviewed with you, the young ladies interviewed on March 23rd? Whenever I was at for the okay. exact date. Fair enough. Now, this fellow Clifton, he goes by a name. He's got a street name, right? Thanks. Thanks. Yes, sir. Okay. He's identified here by Mr. Brown, right? Yes. And he's also identified by the young lady whose brother got killed, right? Uh, yes. Yes. So now we got Mr. Clifton. I'm going to just write the names out here. Good. So other names. Thanks. Z B and B A and X. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Jean is Smitty. And Mook is Mook. Which one is Dixon? All right, his real name is Dixon. Yes. I don't know, I think Mook sounds better, don't you? Okay. All right, let's, let's look at the next mm -hmm. round of people. We've got Carter, the young lady that we're talking about. <coughs> Carter, right? <coughs> And his name, he's got another kind of a nice uh, prosaic name, doesn't he? What's that? Which Clark's name? Which is his name? Oh, Kayvon K. Slum. Yes. K. Slum. Yes, or right. Slum. Yes. Slum, just plain old Slum? Yes, real Slum. All right, we call, we're talking about Slum when we say his name, that's what we're talking about, right? Yes, sir. So you. That's all you went, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so now we got, we got Smitty, we got Banks, actually we got Banks in two places. We got Moot Dixon, and we got Carter Slump, right? Yes. Okay. Now, Moot is also, Moot also shows up in the uh, statement of the young lady whose brother was assassinated, as you said, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And he's seen by her with a magazine which would fit into a some automatic pistol, right? Yes. In his hand running from the car. That's what um, this movie said. That's right. And we never really went beyond that because you're going to put your eggs in one basket with Mr. Brown. No, I interviewed uh, Mr. Dixon. Okay, and Mr. Dixon, I don't know what you're talking about. So you said, so you, were, uh, you, you, you didn't treat him as a suspect anymore? No, he was still a suspect. Um, but obviously the case takes you start getting the, when you combine the eyewitnesses, you combine the gunshot residue, you combine everyone else that we interviewed, it was just hearsay from the street, um, we were comfortable uh, with uh, our two uh, people that were charged, yes sir. You were comfortable with the two people that were charged? Yes, sir. We, 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 were, uh, we had our two shooters. Okay. Now, uh, and you were co and comfortable even in light of the fact that this young lady who was running for her brother who was in the car, you didn't really follow up any of the things that she said to you, did you? No, we, we, we understood what she said. Um, obviously, um, she said there were, you know, she, as she says, uh, case slum or slum uh, running uh, with a gun, which she believed, and uh, Sean Dixon had a magazine in his hand, I think with a bottle of Henny, she may have said. Yeah, that's a good um, um, Brandon Clifton, she mentioned some names. Um, she did mention uh, Mr. Lewis running from the scene. 
Uh, we no, no, let me ask you about that. Yes, sir. She's from St. Louis, right? Yes, she does. She saw him kind of going through the cut, but not the lemon, right? She saw him running from the gun. Going to the cut, yes, sir. But didn't have a gun in his hand, right? No, she did not say that. No, no she didn't, did she? No. And she, he wasn't in that vicinity. He was running towards the cut, which, it, as we know, is up towards Lemon Street. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you've got a couple other people that have said some things in the canvassing that you covered. Um, you spoke to a young lady uh, by the name of Ross. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think you her first name. I, I believe it's the time. She lives know. next door to... Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. She lives next door to Manny. Yes. Uh, and she was cooperative with me. She gave me information. She did. She did. And as a result of talking to her, did you... Uh, come upon the story that this guy, Smitty, Gene, came to her house after the shooting. Remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell the jury what Smitty was saying to her. I don't know if check to that. Smitty can come in and testify that she can't have hearsay. That's what he said. So the sidebar says this is another purpose for it. All right, Mr. Riley, you are uh, going to continue. Thank you. Detective was talking about the young lady that lived next door to man. Yes. Okay. And her last name was Ross? Yes. Sir. All right. You had occasion, one of your people had occasion to interview her in the, in the context of this survey that Canvas in the neighborhood. Yes, sir. All right. As a result of the information that she gave you, what did you develop from that? Um, Ms. Wells uh, told myself and the attorney from the detective that there's a more objective. You can't tell me what Ms. Wells told me. The answer his question was, what did you do as a result? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Well, let me ask you, I'll maybe I can put a point out a bit more. Um, did she indicate at all that someone came to her house? Yes, she did. And that someone that came to her house, did she know him? She did. And what was it, the request he had of her? She, the request that she had of her. No, no, no. The request this person had to her. He wanted her to do something. So again, th this is not what he did. It's what <laughs> somebody said. He, uh, I'll sustain the objection and just try to get to a different way, but I'll sustain the objection when I hear you Do you understand what do you, do you understand what I'm driving at with regard to the interaction she had with the person. Yes. Why was he there? And what your investigation tells me? Judge, I'm going to object because there's no other way he could know that except for what the witness told him. And if we want what the witness told him, we call the witness. That's the whole purpose. But this is not eligible for a hearsay purpose. He's a detective in charge of this entire investigation. Information comes directly to him as it relates to one of these individuals on this chart. And I'm not asking for him from a, from a perspective of hearsay reason. I'm asking him, the information was given to him by Ms. Ross. How did that play into his investigation and what did he do about, do about it? So I understand the state's, uh, the state's objection as to the hearsay nature of the uh, question. Um, Again, uh, the witness is allowed to testify as to what action he took as a result of speaking with individuals. He cannot testify as to what specifically they told him or any conversation that they had. But uh, Mr. Riley is certainly entitled to ask about 
this witness's actions as a result of speaking with those witnesses. Judge, I don't think we can backdoor the hearsay rule by saying, well, what did they tell you? Oh, and then based on that, what did you do? I think you could say, did you receive information from Ms. Ross? And based on that information, right. what did you do? That's a good thing. That's essentially what I said. We agree. No, no. Oh, yeah. That's all right. I've been doing Okay, you yeah, have yeah, an understanding question? We, uh, yes, I received information from Ms. Ross. Right. Um, or, yes, okay. And it in, in, involves a certain person on that list, right? This is it. A person that you have um, eliminated as a suspect, right? At the time I received the information or uh, at the end of the investigation? Whenever you decided you wasn't a suspect. Um, yes, in regard to Bondi Jean at the time. Yes, he was he was a suspect, mm -hmm. um, and uh, based upon the totality of the investigation, uh, all the witness information, uh, all the types of evidence, and we put up all everything together. Javante uh, was eliminated as a suspect. What role did the information you get from the neighbor play in your removing Mr. Smitty as a suspect? What role? You had to put different factors together and come up with an answer. That exchange that took place at her house was significant, wasn't it? There was a significance to it, yes, sir. Yeah. And it had to have played some significant role in your decision-making process to eliminate him. Right? There is part of the question that, and I, I don't, there's part of this answer that I would give, but I, it would have to do with the conversation I had with Miss Miss Walsh, um, which Roger is becoming objective to, so I'm trying to respect that. Um, Don't worry about answers if someone's going to object that with that. Well, hold on. Yeah, that's the email. I'm trying to be cognizant of, of, of the objections to okay. uh, the conversation I had with Miss Walsh. Okay. Um, so there, there was part of that conversation. Um, which, in all honesty, uh, led to um, developing the Lewis as more of a suspect than the Joe Oh, I see. Yes, sir. What happened at the back door caused you to focus more on him? When we started putting everything together and understanding what was happening, yes, sir. Okay. That's correct. Okay, good. Now, I want to ask you about a young man that was interviewed, a guy named McQuaid. Do you remember him? Or Bob McQuaid, yes, sir. Okay. Um, he indicated he, he witnessed some phone conversations or transactions. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you would agree with me that, and the phone conversations had to do with, in fact, he testified to it here, that he overheard Lewis talking on the phone to Saruti. Yes. You remember that? And that uh, he said something about I see you or some, something like that. It was some phone exchange, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, you agree with me in the course of your investigation and in effort to be thorough, you seize the phones or the phone or phones of Mr. Lewis, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And there's investigative techniques to determine what's in the phone, right? Yes, sir. All right. So you tell outcoming calls, incoming calls, text messages, whole variety of different things. Yes, right. Uh, on, on the phones that you have a couple, yes, sir. Yes. And the end result of the investigation, the, the technical part of the investigation, was that there was nothing evidential found on his phone, Mr. Lewis's phone, right? On the phones that were turned over to us, yes, sir. Okay. And it was two phones, right? We received two phones. <coughs> okay. And you received them the night that he was taken into custody, right? Yes. The early morning that he was taken into custody. Honestly. So it was right then, almost contemporaneously with his initial arrest. In other words, he was taken, picked up, taken to the station, and took his phone. Yes, but it was six to eight hours after the, the shoot. That's well after the Facebook. Uh, yes, sir. Wasn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. And you looked at Saruti's phone too, right? Yes, sir. And the net effect of his, the investigation of Saruti's phone and Lewis's phone, there was no phone communication between the two of them, was there? Not on any of the phones that we received. So Mr. McQuetta said he overheard a phone call between the two of them who would have to be on other phones. Yes. Not on the two phones that not on the two phones that were taken by, by the police, right? 
Yes. Okay. And not, and not the phone that was that you had Suri's phone, which had to be imaged and evaluated. That is correct. Okay. Yes. In fact, I think you even asked Mr. Saruti directly on his February 2019 statement um, about a phone call, and he said, he, "Well, there's a good object to that hearsay. You could ask Mr. Saruti about this. You can't ask another witness about what somebody told him. Is there, is there a non hearsay purpose for the uh, Yes, Judge, there is. It's, it's the reality of." Uh, Corroborating what their investigation has already shown, there's no phone contact. <laughs> now, you indicated to us that Mr. Saruti was the beneficiary of a policy or program in the prosecutor's office. You remember that? That's correct. Okay. And this policy, is it in writing somewhere? Does it exist? No, it's one of the, the prosecutors developed Operation Helping Hands, um, which is a strength treatment program uh, for uh, people who wish uh, to try to clean up the opioids. Okay. And is that written down somewhere? There's been press releases, there's been um, articles in the paper, uh, we've worked uh, over nine hours for, for something like that. Have I seen it in writing? No, I'm sure there's a, there's a policy or program for it. Yes. Now, <clears throat> you would agree with me that when officers such as yourself have interaction with um, victims or witnesses, and particularly after in this context of doing interviews, taking doing an interview, that you would write a report. Yes. Sir. Now, did you write a report on the conversations that you had with Mr. Saruti in February 2019? I wrote the program that we had with you. You did? Yes. Okay. Do you have a copy of it with you? All right. Yes, sir. Now, in that report, did you talk to, did you write about the issue in, involving the rehab, that, that Mr. Suri was going to get a rehab uh, placement? Did, did you write that? No. No. Did you, uh, Mr. Suri was in jail at the time, wasn't he? He was. Okay. Now, you're familiar with the investigative report that was recently sent to the prosecutor's office, correct? Which one would that be, sir? I'm going to show you. Judge, I think this initially for the number B1, but I'm not sure. Was it? Yeah, was. Yeah, this is the other copy was marked, but I'll tell you this is B1. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And in that, in that investigative report, Saruti says a number of things, doesn't he? Yes, he does. I'd like to ask you specifically about this. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure you haven't memorized this, so I'll lean over the best I can and show it to you. Uh, he indicates here, and I want you to respond to that. Okay, in an interview with the police, you stated that Brandon Clifton, who the banks as we know, yes. was the person who shot you and then at that time, you remember speaking to the police about that. And he said yes. That, that would have been you. Yes, sir. Okay. And did you identify him at the time as being the shooter? His answer was, yes, I did. Correct. And when you look at the statement from 2019, he does. Yes, sir. Okay, is it true that Brandon, that you're sure Brandon shot you on March 21st, 2017? His answer was no, that's not true. Correct. Sure. Okay. In that statement, he says he was 100% sure. <coughs> Remember that? In the statement that he gave me, yes. Yes, I'm right. sure. Yes, sure. Okay. Okay. Then his question was, okay, why did you give a statement to the police stating that Brandon Clifton shot you that evening? And his answer was, I was. First day, they recommended, I guess they mean police, they recommended that he was a shooter. I was told that if I was to place him there as the shooter, they would let me go into treatment and stuff like that. Okay? Now, this, 
there's a phrase that we've heard ad nauseum. The phrase is quid pro quo, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah, just for that. Is that a reference to a quid pro quo for him to now say in the statement of 19, 2019, that Banks was the shooter? That's the one who's not accurate. Let's go on. Okay, next question. So, you're telling me that they suggested, or that Brandon was the shooter, and if you agreed to that, they would have gotten you into a treatment center. So, he's saying that if he agreed with you that Clifton was the shooter, that he would get into a rehab. True? Yeah, that's not true. Not true. That's, that's What would you be in need of treatment for? And he says heroin, which he was very candid about when he was here. And he says, you were, a her you were a heroin addict at the time of the shooting. And the answer was yes. He goes on, let's see, okay. Top of the page. Okay, so the police wanted to help you. Were you in jail at the time you gave a statement to the police? And the answer was yes. Okay, were they suggesting that you're going to get out at all, anything like that? His answer was, yes. Right? That's what it said. That's what it said. Do you have the authority as a detective to get a person out of jail? No, sir. And you certainly don't have the authority to make a promise like that, do you? Absolutely not. Okay, and that's why you identified Brandon Clifton as the shooter. His answer was, yes. Okay. He talks about the heroin addiction, whether it was high at the time of the shooting. Okay, let's go to the next one. It indicates he's sober today when he gave this interview. Now, he went, he indicated he went to a treatment in Sun, New Jersey. You see that? Yes, sir. How was that paper? Do you have any idea? Uh, it is part of the um, straight to treatment program. I don't, I'm, I don't you know how that's. You don't know? Okay. Yeah, sir. Okay, and then he goes on and says, okay, as you sit here today, you're saying, are you saying that Brandon Clifton is not the person that shot you? And his answer was, yes, I'm saying he's not the person. Okay? Yeah. Then it goes on, he's not. Okay, why are you coming forward today with this? Answer, I just want to see if, I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't want to see a person get charged for something he may not have done, you know, and I can tell you that he did this because I didn't see him do it. Now, he's now saying that he can't say it. That's what he said. That's what he said. <laughs> now, when you were talking to him on the night, the statement was being recorded, right? Yes, sir. But they got to the end, and you you wanted to talk to him off the recording, right? Yes. And in fact, I want to ask you a couple of questions specifically towards the end of the statement. This doesn't bear any exhibit. Do we have a number on this one? If not, I'll get it. I think it's. I'll get a D number. to us that you, you were making arrangements to get him into a rehab, right? Yes, sir. And that's a very commendable thing to do, by the way. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good policy. Um, but you'd also have to get him out of jail, right? I don't, I don't have to get him out of jail. Somebody has to. We have to make arrangements. Yes, sir. Let me ask you this. The, 
the agreement that you had with Mr. Cerruti to send him to a rehab, was that um, approved by anyone in the supervision in the office? As far as an active supervision? Or Anybody. Oh, I'm sure it has to get approved, yes, sir. Okay, you're sure. Yes. But who approved it? It probably went up through um, A.P. Hutchison, A.P. Van Gill, all the way to the prosecutor, I would imagine. I don't know. I just deal with the, like, like direct superiors. All right. Are you suggesting that these two prosecutors were aware of this um, treatment option at the time when you had this conversation with, with Saruti? Yes, sir. Yes. Well, let me ask you this. Would you agree with me, maybe more importantly, that if a person gets a benefit from somebody or some organization, there's a likelihood that they may have a, a bias or a leaning or a sympathy for the organization or per person that got them a benefit. Is that fair to say? I don't. In Mr. Shirley's case, if I can answer No, no, no. I'm talking general. There's, you, you always, I think it's natural for all of us to uh, feel some type of, you know, thankfulness to someone who helps you. Uh, in Mr. Shirley's case, he pled guilty that day, the day he was arrested, for shoplifting in his first appearance in court. Um, we interviewed him that same day, uh, which he provided the statement. He indicated that he was ready to get help to save his life. I don't believe he may not have been alive for this point if we didn't put him in Maria. Well, I, I'm sure that's very commendable, but... but I just finish your hand. Mr. Shruti is still pending sentencing on that shoplifting case, so there, if there was a benefit, I don't know what it is, because he still has to serve whatever sentence he gets for that shoplifting case that he put in. Would you agree with me, as a law enforcement officer, that when you write a report, it's going to be turned over to the defense, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And that report has to be consistent, and it's got to be right, right? Absolutely. And if your report is not correct, and the defense is never provided with the information regarding this deal, it puts the defense in really an unconstitutional uh, uh, position, doesn't it? So I'm going to object to that. You can't make that conclusion. <laughs> I'll sustain the refrain of sustaining to the constitutional position. Are you aware of the discovery rules? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. What, 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 are the, what are they say? We need to learn the entire investigation. Why would you do that? Because it would be unfair if you did. It would be unfair if you did, right, sir? Okay. And if the information was that this young man got actually two benefits one, he gets out of jail, and two, he gets to a rehab. If that information is not provided in discovery, that would be unfair, wouldn't it? I, it's a simple yes or no. It would be unfair, wouldn't it? I, I disagree. It would, it would be fair? I don't think one had to do with the other. He, was gonna, he did not give us a statement. He was still going to rehab. Listen to my question. If you don't put it in a report that this person got a benefit, I would say a significant benefit, wouldn't it? I don't think it's significant, but I think it's under the same thing. So you don't think that's significant? It's significant, yes. What I'm saying is, is that it's not a, um, you would have got that benefit either way. Oh, okay. Okay. That's what you said. Either he gave a statement, or he decided not to give a statement, we were still going to help him go to the Okay. And you wouldn't have any problem talking about that on the recording, would you, if, if this was such a noble uh, endeavor? Mr. Surdy, don't Sir, this, please listen to my question. It's real simple. You would have no concerns about this conversation about the benefits he was getting would be on this recorded statement, which we could later look at and would last forever. I understand what you're saying, sir. Mr. Sweeney, don't do that. We had nothing to do with the murder of Chicago Williams. So if I was going to hand over. So what he saw that day and what he gave a statement to that day had nothing to do with him going to rehab. So if I was going to tell him we were going to talk about that off tape, that is something that had nothing to do with the murder of Shaquille Williams. But you just got finished telling me that the discovery rules require that this information be given up, right? On, on Mr. Shruti's going to rehab? On anybody that's getting a benefit from law enforcement. You go, you're in city and jail, you're offered a benefit. 
go to rehab, do whatever, get out of jail. That's a benefit, right? Judge, we, we heard it, sorry, Bar. Riley, you're right. I'm, I'm going to try this, this question again about benefits. Okay. You get a benefit from the prosecutor's office, law enforcement, right? Okay. And as a result of that benefit, you may very well have developed a bias in favor of the people or the institution that gave you that benefit, right? Yes. Okay, that's simple. Now, when that happens, that is the subject of discovery. You give that over in discovery. So when defendants and lawyers look at the pages, they know what the circumstances were regarding that relationship. Right? Sure, yes. Okay. So you would agree with me, whether you think it's right, wrong, or it's not involved with the murder, or whatever you may say, you would agree with me that that bias, that that benefit, has to be revealed. Right? I, I would agree I did not put that in my report. Say again? I agree that I did not put psychiatry where you go into rehabilitation rehab in my report. You didn't put it in there? No. Okay. Now, at the end of the statement, I want you to just take a look at this. I'm going to show it to you now to maybe read it together and get a flavor of what was being said. This is the last two pages with the statements. Take a moment to look at it. With the statements coming to an end. On both these pages? Yeah, please take the time. In light of our conversation, can you think of any reason why you wanted to talk off the recording to Mr. Cerruti about this situation? What does he say there? I'll show you. Here, I was reading these. Was I reading them? No, I think you're all right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think I'm here.
I recall this was I recall the situation. Okay. Now you would agree with me that at the end of the statement, we'll be wrapping it up. Saruti says to you about what what next, what do we do next? Right? Yes, sir. And that's essentially what he says, right? Yes, he says it's actually if you um you go back to number forty five, page forty five here, um I said, all right, give us a couple seconds, it'll take you back down. And then he says, and then what? And then what? Yes, sir. Yes. When you say, give us a few seconds, we'll take you back down. What end of recording? So, yeah, I want to do it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, we'll get there. Okay. Yes. You, you said you got to take him back down. We have to take him back down, too. Back down to the, uh, back down to the BCJ. And Joe. Okay. So he says, and then what? If this is all the, everything's been done, conversation, he said Banks is the shooter and all that stuff, right? So Banks and Bell were the shooter. Oh. Okay, so, well, actually, he says in there, he says he's not so sure because he didn't see. So, right? That's what he says. In his second statement. Yes. So, so Suri says, and then what? And then you say, we'll, we're, we're working with that. What's that? So you let us, let us leave. We'll end the recording. Then we'll talk about other stuff later. All right. Right? Yes, sir. There's no reason why he couldn't have talked about the other stuff now, is there? The other stuff that we were talking about was getting him back into rehab. And you didn't want this on the recorded statement, did you? About him going into rehab? No. It had nothing to do with the shooting, which was what the investigation was about. Well, if, if, if the program that you set up for him and, and the manner in which things were evolving was no above board, you wouldn't care if this was on a recorded statement or not, would you? It is no one above board, but... Yes. Then, why, then why are you cutting him off when he wants to talk about it? I don't want to talk about it now, we'll talk about it later, when we're off the recording. That's what you said, so, right? Yes, but he's talking about, there's, there's a time issue. So the time issue was we had him up in our office um, after he went to court. When anyone, anyone comes to the prosecutor's office when they don't have court, everyone downstairs thinks, that are upstairs right So the individuals who we're talking to, they get nervous because they don't want to go back and one county of jail and have people asking them questions. So the best that we can get them back down and then pull him the next day, which took us two days to get him to security rehab. Uh, and in order to do so, we had to have sheriff's officers go get him, so people downstairs thought he was going to court. So there is a panic if you're up with the prosecutor's office too long and you're going to get questions. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And all of that could have been done while the tape recording was running. When you said exactly what you just said to the jury, you say to him. But you didn't. You wanted it off the recording. I didn't want it off the recording. That, the recording is with a witness interview just like that. We don't have to, we do not, we're not required to do, it's not a stem to stern type of situation, but you know what that is. Mm -hmm. Once the, from, from start to finish, all it was is when, the, when we were done asking our questions that were relevant to the investigation of the murder of Shaquille Williams, we then stopped. Uh, okay. There was no questioning after that in regards to the murder. So the treatment of, of what, the only eyewitness that was, it was in the car, he was in the car, right? Yes, he was a serious witness, very important witness. The fact that he got a benefit, you don't think has any relevance as it relates to the defense, prosecution defense of this case, right? Is that what you're saying? He saw, he, no, he saw what he saw in regards to the shooting of his friend. And he, and he told us that. Yes. Yes, he did. And later on he says he was lying because... He was lying about Brandon. He didn't say about Doug. Well, and let's talk movie. about Brandon then. He indicates that he was lying about Brandon in an effort to get this deal. This deal that you did not want to discuss with the recording machine on because you're in such a hurry to get someplace that you couldn't have a conversation with him 12 seconds like you just did with the jury and have it recorded. You shut, up, shut down the recording because you didn't want anybody to know about it. And you didn't put it in your report either, did you? That is true. Did not. You didn't. And I don't think you did. I discussed with Mr. Van Gilst either. Well. About the information that, that should have been put out in discovery. In regards to I was ready to go into rehabilitation. What have we been talking about for the last 20 minutes? I understand. Why have such difficulty answering that question? I, I believe I've answered it a number of times. Well, then, then you don't have to keep answering that. Mm -hmm. 
The information was discoverable, wasn't it? I will be. I don't know if Kites really go into a rehabilitation center is discoverable, discoverable information. To the extent that it might have an impact on his predisposition to give favorable testimony to the state after they've given him clearly a benefit, you don't think that information should have been on discovery and reviewed by Mr. Van Gale, sent out discovery, so that us would have some idea what's going on because if we didn't know it from somebody else, we wouldn't have seen it in your report, and we sure wouldn't have seen it on, on the tape statement, would we? We wouldn't have seen it in my report. Or the tape statement, would we? Oh, then I had to do it with Mr. Shakur on the street. So the information regarding that, unless somebody came up with it and discovered it somehow, never would have seen the light of day, because it wasn't in your official police report, and it wasn't in a transcript of the statement that you took from Mr. Suri, right? Correct. That's okay. Is that okay? I would learn from, uh, if it was a mistake that is discoverable, it would be in my report the next time. I did not know taking the security to a rehabilitation center would go in my official police report in regards to the murder of Chicago. Okay. And you also don't feel it was investigatively uh, necessary to follow up the information you got from the sister of the assassinated driver to go do a very simple investigative task, which is to follow up what she said and look at Facebook and see if there's a guy named Clifton or, or, or Kayvon Carter or Clifton with a gun in her hand waving it around like she described. You don't, you don't think that was important enough either then, right? Based on the information we had, we decided not to. You had the opportunity to maybe capture one of the shooters with a gun in his hand within hours after it happened, right? It wasn't one of the shooters. Without getting into what she says, word for word, it'd be fair to say that they were um, running away from the car, right? Yes, and even with even guns in their hands. A lot of people were running away. With guns in their hands, right? There's a lot of people with guns in their hands that night, yes. Can't you just answer the question straight up? It's not his answer to the question. No, he's not. He's not. The question was, with guns in their hands, right? That's a yes or no. Ms. Newton said they were in the room running. On the streets where guns are yes. Yes, from the car where her brother was assassinated. From the area where her brother was assassinated. Fine. I'm Jack Fisher, thank you. Detective, does the fact that someone has a gun that's in several hours later on social media mean that they were the shooter? No, sir. Did you investigate this case uh, thoroughly? Yes, I did. And did you speak with, or did other detectives speak with a number of different witnesses? Yes, we did. Now, I want to start where Mr. Riley left off, and then we'll move back from there. He asked you about 122, S122 for identification, the statement from Kahit Sarubi on February 6, 2019, correct? Yes, yes, sir. And in that statement, do you reference the fact um, that he's going to rehab or you're going to try to work to get him into rehab? I have to check this out. Specifically referring you to page... Same, same information that Mr. Ryan... Oh, yes, I said, well, yes. Um, that you'll talk about something off tape? Yes. What were you referring to there? Mr. Sure, you wanted to know when he was going to be able to get into rehab. It took us um, approximately two days uh, to get him a bed in the rehabilitation center. Uh, and also, um, he wanted to go back down to his, his cell because he didn't want people to know he was up at the prosecutor's office for this time period. Okay, and that transcript, was that turned over to the center? Yes. Now, was Mr. Cerruti's criminal history also turned over to the Yes. In that criminal history, does it indicate when he pled guilty to the shoplifting that he was brought up on? Yes, sir. Was that prior to you taking the statement from him? It was. He pled guilty prior to the statement? Yes, sir. 
Did you make any promises to him about his charge or his sentence? No, I did not. Has Kahid Sruti ever been sentenced on that shoplifting charge? No, he has not. So that's still pending? Yes, sir. Did you ever condition this statement for, let me rephrase it, did you ever condition him getting into rehab on him giving a statement? No, I did not. Was he going to rehab either way? Yes, he was. Did you ever recommend to him the names Doug Lewis or Brandon Clinton? No, I did not. The statement that Mr. Riley mentioned, it's Mark D1 for identification. Who was that statement given to, sir? Is that uh, the newest one from Mr. Security? Yes. A private investigator. And who did that private investigator work for? The attorney for Brandon Clinton. Okay. And in that statement, he indicates Brandon Clinton wasn't involved. Is that correct? Or worse? Yes, okay. Yes. Did you ever say Doug Lewis isn't involved? No. Never once? Never once. And he told you he was involved in the February 2019 statement, correct? He did. Was that Doug Lewis? Yes. And Brandon Clifton? Yes. Now, Mr. Riley questioned you about the name. Do you, you remember that? Yes. That's the sister of Shaquille Williams, the man who was killed. Yes, sir. <laughs> Now, did she witness the shooting? She did not. What did she witness? She heard she witnessed people running away. Okay. And did she provide you information regarding who was running away? Yes. And who was running away? Brandon Clifton, Kayvon Carter, and Doug Lewis. Okay. Brandon Clifton and Kayvon Carter, where were they running? They were running down Kingsley. Okay. And did she have an opportunity to observe those individuals? Yes. And did, it, did at least one of them have a gun in his hand? Yes. Which one? Uh, Kayvon. Where was Doug Lewis running? He was running the opposite way. Was that away or towards Miss Newton? Uh, away from Miss Newton. When she was, he was running away from Miss Newton, you, you've been to the scene, correct? Yes, sir. Was the direction away from Miss Newton on Manny's porch? No. Was it running towards Manny's porch? No, it was not. There was some mention of Miss Ross, the time the Ross. Yes, sir. And where does she live in relation to all this? Uh, next door, connected to Manny's house. I think it was 143 Kinsley. 143 Kinsley? Yes, sir. Did she ever once indicate to you that she saw the shooting? No. The information she provided you during the course of this investigation, when does that start? When does the first thing she sees? Is it before or after the shooting? After the shooting. Were there any eyewitnesses that were interviewed during the course of this case that actually saw the shooting? Yes, sir. Who were those individuals? Mark Brown, Mark Juan McClure, and Heidi Surrey. Was there any other person that was interviewed, came forward, subsequently came forward, that provided an eyewitness account of the shooter? No. No further questions. Just very briefly, um, you indicated that um, Kayvon had a gun, right? Yes, sir. And then you told us that Lewis was running also, but he was running in a different direction. As we indicated, I questioned you towards uh, Lemon. The we're talking about the same cut, Mr. Riley, there's a couple of cuts, I think, in that area. Okay. There's one, I'm sure, Mr. Ross. Um, this is the Parcells said, which is further down in Kinsley. Yeah, it's more up towards, uh, it's more of an angle. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. Yes. Lewis didn't have a gun in the did Ms. Newton, uh, could not see that from what I from what I remember the worst day. Yes. She didn't tell you she said he had a gun in the same day. No, she did not. But she did say about Kayvon's son. Yes. 
she told you about St. Kayvon later on on what? Facebook. Thank you. That's another question. And the observation she made with Kayvon with the gun was after the shooting had concluded, correct? That's correct. Okay. Would you agree with me that sometimes the behavior after an incident can be as probative and as enlightening as behavior before the incident? Can you rephrase that? Sure, I'll give it my best shot. Do you agree with me that the behavior after an incident takes place can be very relevant in determining the person's mindset before the incident took place and or the incident itself. I thought you speak for other people's mindsets. Well, you seem to be able to because you're ruling people in and ruling people out based on your chart. Not based on their own mindset. Right. Thank you, sir. That's my favorite question. I think that concludes your testimony. You step down your finished. Counsel, I get a brief side.